Welcome to another edition, the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 505. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Monday, the 20th of May, 2019. We celebrate and remember a, a wonderful orthodox uh, fighter against heresy called Alcuin of York. Okay, thank you for watching. You already probably know this, but you have a responsibility as the viewer and listener to Anglican Unscripted. The first responsibility is to share this program with your friends or enemies, however you want to look at it. You just click the share button there if you find it on the website or if you find it on Facebook or YouTube and enter an email address or copy and paste it to your Facebook page uh, or just send it around. We don't care how you share we just appreciate that you do. Please comment on the uh, show. It's got 85 comments in the last show. It's a lot of fun to, to read through those and find out how you're correcting our grammar because sometimes we split our infinitives and that's just the way it is. Sorry. Also, like us. If you find us on Facebook, you find us on YouTube, wherever you find our show, click the like button so that they know that you really like us. Kind of a Sally Field moment for us. Guys, how's it going? What's what you doing this uh this Monday, George? I, I am so excited. I saw Gavin in the sun, and he wasn't <laughs> even wearing a bathing suit. <laughs> Gavin, I I I have uh, really some pride about our my co-host here. Gavin has was in the Sun, the Express, right. which papers I read. These are <laughs> British tabloids, red tops that. Uh, where it used to have uh, naked girls on page three and then the news and Gavin is there, uh, but he's not naked, but he was also in the Daily Mail and in the, in the Telegraph, but it all started in the Sunday Times where he had pride of place in an article about the craziness at uh, the church in Darlington up in uh, the Diocese of Durham. Uh, I'm proud because uh, Gavin, this makes me pr proud and also gives me sort of a sense of a question to ask. Uh, Gavin, you can tell the, what the story is actually about, but Gavin was the person that all of these newspapers plus a radio station, Premier Radio and LBC, was it, uh, mm. went to, who was the go-to guy for a voice of Christian sanity on an issue. Is it a bishop of the Church of England? Is it a canon theologian professor from Oxford University? Who is it that they go to when they want plain speaking, clear thinking, about issues of Christian faith and morals, it's Gavin Ashenden. Now, is that a good thing, Gavin, or a bad thing, <laughs> that you have become the voice the of voice. reason in religion in England? Well, well, it's tell us what's going thing. on. What's going on it's, in the Sunday time? It's a very scary thing, but the most exciting thing happened today when LBC phoned me. LBC is the commercial radio station in London. And the guy who runs the morning show is a man called Nick Ferrari. He's a very big man. He He's like a tank. He literally crushes views he doesn't approve of. And uh, uh, they are—they phoned me up after this media coverage of the weekend, and uh, he began by uh, by being quite aggressive. Um, I put the interview on my website because at the end, he does something quite astonishing. He apologizes. He says, I got this completely wrong, and you're completely right. And I must say, I don't remember that uh, happening in such a context before. The, the, um, the issue was about a rather a rather silly vicaress who uh, responded to a, a mayor in Darlington in County Durham. And the mayor wanted to, pr to promote good relations between members of the community, and he thought he could do it through the churches. And everyone did it in the most amateur and silly way. Uh, and the amateur way was to invite the Muslims, uh, actually just following the <laughs> example of, and I'm sorry, I'm going to say it again, people got very cross, with, some people got cross with me and some people applauded it but i i cannot call sarah mulally bishop of london she's not a bishop for me and i'm not being rude about her she's a great midwife and i'm sure she's quite clearly a charming person um but but they were following her example of inviting muslims at st paul's cathedral for an iftar meal but they did it they had a they had a meeting and in this pcc meeting the parish council meeting they decided they would invite the muslim men and women to the church the men would go into the center of the church to pray on the assumption that Allah is exactly the same as Yahweh, which he isn't. And the women would go into a side aisle. 
where there was some lovely aside room where there's some nice crosses and a very beautiful picture of Jesus, the light of the world by Holman Hunt, the pre-Raphaelite painting. And the vicar said, we'll cover Jesus up and we'll cover the crosses up. Somebody, thank God, <laughs> leaked the minutes of this meeting to somebody else and it very quickly made its way to the Sunday Times and there was a nice journalist called Nicholas Helen and Nicholas says, Gavin, if I ask you for a quote, will you please do it? in an unabstract, concrete way that any idiot can understand. And he gives me quite a hard time because I want to speak to him long in, in long paragraphs full of theological language. Um, I, I think our listeners will understand the experience of the Holy Spirit coming because sometimes things crystallize in your head and you know it wasn't you. And so the Lord, I thought the Lord gave me a wonderful phrase, which was quite powerful. Nicholas immediately took it and printed it. And then the rest of the press in the Church of England, followed it up. I'm afraid I was promoted to become a senior bishop. I don't know how that quite works, <laughs> except that I noticed that Jane Ozan describes herself as a senior member of the General Synod, so perhaps I'm on the same conveyor belt as she is. Um, but the, the interesting thing is it was taken up by the press, and they, they did see this as being an issue of some importance, even if they didn't initially understand what the issues were. The issues either are how lovely of the Christians to forsake their own heritage and principles to be nice to Islam because somebody ought to be nice to the Muslims nowadays or else it was some Christians are standing up for their principles we don't quite understand is this a dangerous thing is it phobic can we get an explanation and so on that basis uh, I was asked I was asked to comment I, I do th I do think that it's a goodness of the Holy Spirit uh, I, I wouldn't have expected such an extraordinary platform and having been given it my goodness I'm going to use it well, I think the biggest issue is there's such a vacuum uh, amongst the bishops and clergy within the Church of England. I think Justin Welby has a complete lockdown on anybody speaking, anybody dissenting, or anybody giving their own opinion on what's going on in the culture of uh, English society. And they're sitting at their news desk, who do we call? Well, Justin doesn't return our calls. I don't dare call this person or this person. Or per I don't call anybody in purple. Let's call Gavin Ashenden. He always gives us a good quote, and he makes sense. And it worked. Kevin, Kevin, and uh, Ge Kevin, your point is spot on because you, you may remember about three years ago we had a similar incident at the church in Wat uh, in Diocese of Southwark at Waterloo. I forget the name of the church. The uh, vicar of that St. John's Waterloo um, near the train station. Mm -hmm. uh, the vicar is one of the leaders of the modern church persons union or whatever it's calling itself these days and he invited uh, muslims into the church and the uh whether it was the sexton or somebody covered up some very uh you know christian art and uh, the cross and whatnot and this hit the papers and the bishop of southwark got involved and he made a very strong you know it was pushed you know we will speak to this man this is never going to happen again it's quite clear under canon law the church of england non-christian worship may not take place in church of england facilities and at the time when this broke this was a big story now this time around have we had a single church of england bishop do with the bishop of southwark who is very liberal and trying to get him to condemn what happened was like getting teeth pulled, but he did it. <laughs> now, apart from the art, local archdeacon up in the Diocese of Durham, who basically said to the, the vicar, you can't do this because here's the canon law saying, why not? We've not had the same level of Episcopal oversight that we had in Southwark. Now, it's so because anything that happens north of a line drawn between the, uh, the, the uh, Liverpool and the Wash, you know, anything north of that, nothing, that's not really the world. I mean, that's the third world as England is concerned. So Durham is uh, the back of the beyond. It doesn't matter. And London is all that counts. I'm... Or is it that we've had a change so profound in the uh, ability of bishops to speak about issues of faith and morals that they can't George, talk about? I'm still, I've got this picture of Sarah Mulally in, in, in an Episcopal hijab, just ingrained on my, on my, my inner retina. Uh, mind you, my retina is in a bit of a bad shape. I better choose something else. But I, the 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 idea that a, a woman who holds the Gavin, office, Gavin, Gavin, it was a purple chapel veil. 
that remember mm. i thought we had made the point that she had become an anglo catholic and was now wearing taking seriously paul's injunction for women to cover their heads in church i thought that if, was it, the, if, uh, if it had been a mantilla she would have um, warmed my heart but as it was it was a purple hijab the idea uh, three years ago the bishop of london would not have whatever gender uh would not have covered up to, to 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 please muslims i mean you know you you can when mrs may does it or some politician does it they're getting votes in you understand i mean i didn't approve it's a terrible thing to do it, it it's a it's a dimmy status it's terrible but for a for a woman who holds the episcopal office in the diocese of london uh, I, I mean I, it's, it's beyond words but i think it represents a very serious degradation of climates in the answer to your question how would you distinguish this between the politeness of removing one's shoes when you enter a mosque? If you enter a mosque as a tourist, as a worshipper, everybody takes their shoes off. And isn't this just a feminine, if you will? I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, yeah. What's no, the difference I, no, I'm, between, I'm... What's the difference between uh, assuming a costume uh, dictated by the Muslim understanding that women need to be veiled to protect men from the inherent sinfulness of women? That's why women are veiled. That's why they're covered up. Not to protect the woman, but to protect men from seeing them and taking off your shoes as a matter of, uh, as a mark of respect for holy ground. I, I think the answer is that taking off your shoes is, a, is a, a very widespread custom that everyone does without uh, a great deal of theological or cultural baggage in it. Um, you have to work quite hard to invest it with cultural, philosophical and theological meaning. The problem with covering for women uh, is that it's immensely problematic, even for Muslims. In fact, it's not even required in the Quran. It, it's, it's part of one of the later Wahhabi um, uh, changes or that represents a form of fundamentalist Islam. So in terms of the semiotics, the code it sends out, first of all, within Islam itself, it means we're doing hardcore Islam here. And secondly, there are, at least in terms of secular understanding of gender, some terribly serious issues about, just as you described, the way in which women see themselves in relationship to men. Now, for, for, the, for, for, the, for the Bishopette of London to buy into all of those as, as a represent, as most senior representative of Anglicanism in this country, stretching back to the, I don't know when the diocese was founded, the seventh century, um, I, and, and the other element is, I'm, I'm struggling because I'm speechless with something or other. It, it does, of course, represent what the Muslims understand as, as dimmy status. In other words, Muslims, when they move into an area and they move it from, uh, uh, the, they confront the world of Islam and, and the world of war, they say to people they move in amongst, you have three choices. You either convert to Islam or we kill you or you accept subservient status and we will, we will charge you some very serious taxes. Now, covering up in this way is not a sign of hospitality to, to, to Islam. It's a sign of the acceptance of demi subservient status. And indeed, it is to many, many Christians as well. So that the fact that, that this senior representative of the church, uh, so poorly theologically educated as she is, should accept on, our, on, on the behalf of all Christians and our culture this, this semiotic of servitude, it's, it's just terrible. Um, now, the fact that, that that's one of the changes of the last three years, it's very serious. Hmm. Okay. I, I just wanted to mention uh, one of the little stories that were percolating through Anglican Inc. is a little story out of the West Bank in uh, Palestine, Israel. The Anglican Church, one of the Anglican churches there uh, was uh, ransacked. Uh, it's altar broken up, statues destroyed, crosses broken up because the rector refused to pay what is called jizya. Protection that's money. it, the dimmy tax. Yeah, that's the dimmy tax. And yeah. who who was instituting this tax? Fatah, the uh, organization, the, the the political party that controls the West Bank. And that this is not some medieval uh, or some ISIS only worldview. Uh, this is this is happening in Palestine, not okay. just in yeah. not just in Darlington. Pakistan, Syria, Iran, uh, it happens everywhere. It's just the, the, the modus operandi of this um, religion to say, we're in charge, we'll let you be here, but you got to pay to be our friends. Kevin is right. And, and, and the, how is it possible 
that someone like Sarah Mullally or even this, you know, the hugely under-resourced Vicar of Darlington, how is it possible they don't hear the voices that have come out of the Middle East? There was a profoundly moving uh, broadcast by a bishop in Iran uh, saying, beware of Muslims, as he stood in the ruins of his cathedral saying, this is, they, well, they've done this to us and they will do it to you. Please pay attention and listen. And the idea that, 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 a, that a, this vicar in Darlington and Sarah Mullally of London can simply accept uh, the, 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 the semiotics of servitude, as we call them, and they are, are, and not understand the effect they have on Christians worldwide. What, what, what does Asya Bibi think when she sees a, a, a famous Christian leader in the West do, doing this? I mean, it, it's grotesque. It, it is close to being spiritually obscene. And I'm, I'm very glad that some Christians at least are willing to stand up and make a fuss about it. Why I'm saying that this uh, West Bank story is percolating is that uh, the Diocese of Jerusalem will not comment on and talking to people who I know in the diocese off the record say, look, we take our life in our hands. You just want to have a 400 word story that uh, will be mildly interesting to your readers. If we criticize Islam, if we criticize the state, they will kill us. That's right. And, you know, we, and I always get a little bit irritated when I hear Justin Welby and uh, before him, Rowan Williams blathering on about, isn't it a shame about the erasure of Christianity from the Middle East? Well, you have, to, you have to ask, why is this happening? The Christian Arab population of Israel is actually growing. It is in those areas controlled by Hamas, Fatah, ISIS, uh, the secular uh, Egypt, the, where the secular government of Egypt, where Christians are under fire by is the establishment. I have a story that I don't think I've told very often. If I have, you must stop me because I live in terror of becoming a, an amnesiac bore. But um, I remember about five years ago, my daughter and I got up about six o'clock and she says, Daddy, you're in the Daily Mail again. You've been saying that the, there's violence in the Quran. And I, I had, uh, and I got a phone call from the palace. I was due to preach St. James's Palace in the Royal Chapel. And the senior chaplain said, You've, we're going to have to cancel you. MI5 have phoned. And there's a death threat out on you because of what you said about the Quran. I mean, all I had said was there are a hundred verses uh, recommending violence, which is simply true. Um, and I said, I, I don't want you to cancel. I'm quite willing to come in the face of a death threat. And he said, well, actually, the palace authorities have decided they don't want your blood on their carpet, so you can't come. <laughs> I said, I protest. I have a right to come. And they said, well, the Queen, you know, if the Queen's advisors don't want blood on the carpet. They're entitled to worry about their carpets. So the agreement was, it was about six weeks ago, they, they'd wait and they'd see. And about 10 days before, they said, okay, the, the assassinating, the assassinate Ashenden chatter has reached a much lower level. <laughs> uh, and we, uh, they're, they're, going to put, they're going to put snipers on the roof and they're going to give the police uh, larger machine guns at each end of the road that leads to St. James's Palace. And on that basis, I got to preach. So it's no, it's no surprise to me to be told that people are being threatened with violence. The surprise, what's the surprise is that, that, that the people in the West who, who only get their news sanitized by the media don't understand that that is the normative face of Islam uh, in so many parts of the world where, where it no longer suits them to go courteously. I if, I may jump, uh, if I may jump, I'm sorry, Kevin, I got to jump in. I got to jump in and get uh, Gavin and we've been in, in in the United States. We've been seeing little news reports about violence in Oldham. Evidently, yes. his name Tommy yes. Robertson has been speaking on the political campaign. And we're and of course, uh, according to the uh, British press, he is a crypto fascist and that wherever he speaks, there's violence. Well, if you look on Facebook and if you look in some other media sources, you find out that the violence is that the Muslim Brotherhood has been attacking him and uh, his rallies. Who has been throwing bricks at women and children who've come out to listen to him? Who has been causing the violence? And it's not been Tommy Robinson, his supporters, as far as I can tell, and my faraway perch in the U.S., but it is uh, Muslim uh, fanatics. But the real problem is that these, these I mean, Tommy Robinson is, is, is a problematic figure. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, he's more sinned against than sinning by a very long way indeed. And there is a state conspiracy to shut him up. And there's a very real chance he may be assassinated. Yeah. Uh, there is nothing, 
oh, there's nothing racist about him. Uh, all his friends are multicolored ethnics uh, and always have been because of the way he grew up. But he is challenging Islam in a big way. And the really frightening thing is that he has been so toxified as a figure that if you, if I put up these videos which show what is really happening, uh, it almost makes us uh, the equivalent of Hindu untouchables in terms of the public space. So thorough a job of toxification has the media done, which means telling the truth in any way becomes incredibly difficult. Uh, and Tommy can be his own worst enemy. I mean, he, he's not without sin in this, but yeah, I, I've never seen the BBC come down so hard on one person uh, to make sure that whatever he says is completely distorted. Um, it, it's the way it is. I want to get to, in our show notes, when we were talking about, about this, we made reference to some other topics. I don't know if we want to get to those or not before the end of the program. We're doing 20 minutes here. Did you want to hit uh, the rewriting of history with George Bell, or did you want to hit uh, uh, well, yes, dissent within yeah. uh, Lambeth, uh, with a, you know, the upcoming Lambeth conference? Which one? Let's oh, do Bell, both. I think. We'll do both. Okay. Do both. Now, <laughs> anybody who knows Kevin knows my favorite book is by George Orwell, 1984. Maybe because I graduated high school in 1984, it was required reading, and I, I went page by page, and I'm looking for you know, a little bit of me and Winston were, were were brothers because well at the time there was a Soviet Union and um, I could just see this happening behind the uh, the Iron Curtain over there and the the book was you know uh, momentous in my early development and understanding of politics uh, I'm a child of the 80s it's the way it was and watching politics now I always compare stuff to 1984 to the rewriting of history to the telling the same lie over and over again until somebody believes it um, to Oh, one day they're my enemy, one day they're my friend. And uh, it, it's happening today all the time. We have now read a, a recent report where it's going to happen, or it's been happening at a cathedral, and I thought uh, we could have Gavin talk about uh, 1984 rewriting history, the Church of England style. Well, like you, Kevin, I've just ha I'm halfway through it again. I last mm -hmm. read it in 1970, and I decided I really ought to read it as an adult instead of a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Simmons is a wonderful man and has been leading the campaign to get George Bell uh, restored, um, has, has got stuck because there's some Anglican nuns gave a very beautiful building opposite the cathedral in Chichester to the cathedral. They made a free gift of it mm -hmm. because they loved George Bell and they said, we'll give it to you if you call it George Bell House. So the cathedral received it. They did call it George Bell House and this is the house they renamed and to call it number four Cannon Lane. And um, nothing can be done, even booing the Bishop of Chichester at a meeting of, uh, of, of the, I was at. Even that hasn't changed it. But most, not only have they not, not, not changed their view, despite Lord Carlyle saying categorically that the innocence of George Bell was beyond a peradventure. But um, I've just been written to saying that uh, the records of an ecumenical conference called the Coburg Conference have begun to be disappeared and become unused from the cathedral's website. Now, this this is no small conference. When I was uh, a canon at Chichester, uh, Bishop John Hind used to make a great deal about the importance of the ecumenical relationships with the Lutherans in Germany uh, in the name and under the inspiration of George Bell. It was a very big thing. The cathedral reveled in it. Uh, and whenever it came round, a good deal was made of it. Now, it, not only is it not happening, but somebody is going back through the internet archives of the cathedral and deleting all reference to it as if it never happened. George Bell is becoming an unperson. The fact that the Church of England can behave like, like, like Orwell's uh, description of the absolutist state ought to cause really serious alarm. I, uh, I studied Russian in uh, college and I uh, remember one of my senior year projects uh, my instructor had me uh, compare versions of the 1933 Soviet Great Encyclopedia with, I believe it was the 1940 or 41 version. And as you would go through, a whole people would be dis people would disappear from history. Photographs were be people would be airbrushed out of group photographs, and as soon as they were purged, as soon as they became unpersons or non-persons. 
a razor blade would be taken to the encyclopedia and their page cut out and their their face blackened over. Um, we saw it's actually, I remember complaining about 15, 10 years ago, whenever it was, when the Red Book, which is the Episcopal That's Church right. annual directory, mm -hmm. uh, dropped Bob Duncan as ever having been Bishop of Pittsburgh. And I said, you know, what the hell are you doing? You can't do this. I mean, who was Bishop of Pittsburgh in this gap period? Well, I think they fixed it. I don't remember if they when they fixed it, but <laughs> and it may have just been a, a proof, whatever. But auto, it is not. There's nothing new under the sun. Trying to erase history, trying to destroy the memory of uh, that, that has gone before, is the first is an action of a tyrant. Uh, it's kind of, sometimes it works. It's kind of hilarious that the Red Book was Pravda for the Episcopal Church, uh, but you know. <laughs> but the, the the fact the fact is it it is a, it ought to be a source of great moral shame to the church that is that is not only continuing to allow someone's reputation to suffer this terrible cloud, but trying to rewrite history to justify their own cowardice. Uh, and their own bankruptcy. I mean, it's a really serious moral problem. Well, let, 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 Gavin, let's just slightly take aside uh, a skewed vision. Uh, I was investigating a wonderful rumor that turned out to be false this morning about the Church of England. And we were discussing this, whether we should go on air and say, we can now tell you this is not true, which <laughs> would have been fun, but not, not, well, not particularly well, ethical. We but, wouldn't lower ourselves to that standard yet. Right, yet. <laughs> But, you know, it, I said, Gavin, do you think this is malice or incompetence? And it turned out to be incompetence. And is this malice on the part of the Bishop of Chichester, the Diocese of Chichester, or is it incompetence a part of a webmaster at the cathedral? I mean, or is this part of a ongoing attempt to erase George Bell from the, mem from the cultural memory of the Diocese of Chichester? Well, is it malice or is it incompetence? There are things we know and the things we don't know. We know it is not incompetence. You don't you don't go back and trawl a long way through archives by incompetence. So it's absolutely deliberate. Who would have ordered this? Well, it must have the authority of the dean. Certainly, it couldn't be done without it. Does it have the authority of the bishop of Chichester? I would have thought it unlikely the dean would have taken this step without consulting the bishop of Chichester. Does it have? Has a bishop of Chichester consulted Welby or Peter Hancock? That's entirely possible. Perhaps we should ask them, George. Perhaps you could send them a comment and ask them whether they've been consulted about this and whether this suppression of George Bell's very existence has their imprimatur on it. But what, what motive could, what rational motive? Uh, I mean, are these people who, are they, are they trying, what are they try seeking to accomplish? You cannot erase George Bell from history. I think um, it's probably just embarrassment. Yeah, I think it's yeah, probably that's the just embarrassment. It, yeah. All right. Well, we need to transition people because we have an inpatient audience who have lives that are not just spent <laughs> in front of YouTube watching us twice a week. Well, it should be. Yeah, well, except for the, those members of our audience who are inpatients. That that's right. Okay, yes. I, the there's probably a, a large proportion of people have to uh, get stuck watching us in institutions. We apologize. Which, which reminds me, we, we haven't had a chance to discuss Jane Ozan's contribution. Uh, that's, the, that's the transition. <laughs> uh, Lambda 2020. Uh, we used to always joke, is it going to happen? We now know that uh, GAFCON uh, bishops are not going to go, uh, as best we can tell. Some. Some, some. Might, some might, some might not. Um, we know that there's a big controversy over what spouses can and cannot go, and uh, Justin Welby's had to, to tend some fires he caused with that. And now we have some dissent from, I guess we call them senior people in the uh, administration. And I thought, George, you could uh, talk to that real quick. Jane Ozan, editor of the Media News, a leading member, as she describes it, of General Synod and the Archbishop's Council, has uh, denounced Justin Welby for being manipulative, coercive, and uh, frankly evil towards gays and lesbians. And she cites uh, his sacrificing gay and lesbian spouses of gay bishops and not inviting them to Lambeth 2020 to preserve the unity of the church. She says, this unity is a golden calf, it's a fig leaf, the church is not united, it will never be divided. And the time has come to drive out the Pharisees, to drive out 
those people who are building churches and hanging on to their ill-gotten pensions so that the church can be purified so that only right-thinking people will be called and known as Anglicans, a member of the Anglican Communion. It's quite an extraordinary piece. I do recommend people read it. And Gavin, is, uh, in your opinion, is she correct? Um, the interesting thing psychologically is that very often when people are, are cross or disturbed or, or driven by, by an, an animus they're not very much in control of, they accuse other people of behavior that they exhibit themselves. And I think this is an exact example of it. So Jane Ozan's piece is, is bullying, uh, it's full of malice, it's full of anger, and she wants to strip away even the pensions of the people who disagree with her. And she wants them to be thrown out of the church. Now, as an act of, 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 of bullying, controlling, unkindness, uh, this is really quite up there. But of course, instead of owning it for herself, she's accusing Justin Welby of being guilty of these things. I think the trouble is that, that um, and how does one say this nicely? Because Jane Ozan is a nice woman at, at heart. I, I knew her many years ago. Before she became a lesbian activist, she was, uh, she, she was a, a kind, stable, loving follower of Jesus, having discovered herself as a lesbian and wanting to justify it, and, to, and as so many do, make the church party to that justification. She's become consumed by a degree of anger uh, and now it looks like I've frozen too. Oh, by a degree of, 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 yes, uh, of anger and, um, uh, and, and rage uh, and, and great threat. Uh, about two years ago, I was sharing a World Service interview with her and, and she said, how does it feel like to be a murderer? And I said, well, Jane, I'm not a murderer. She said, yes, you are. You're guilty by association because there are, there are gay men in... I forget which particular African country it was, Uganda, I think. There are gay men in Uganda who've been murdered by by other people uh, and you are party to it. You are a murderer. And I said, Jane, this is a very unreasonable way of talking. And also this, you know, this guilt by association thing, it's it's very much a tool of the left and completely improper. And I think mm. I feel very sorry for her because I think her grasp of, of, of reality, compassion uh, and stability is really quite... Is, is jeopardized by her commitment to trying to get everyone to accommodate her sexuality publicly. I also want to affirm that we have heard from other people, reliable sources, that Justin is a bully. I mean, I, I don't well, want I've to... Seen, I've, seen, I've seen him do that. Okay. But I, think, I don't, but I I think, don't want I think to deny Jane... some of the truth of what she's saying just because she's using transference. I really, I, I actually think that, that they're two separate issues. Okay. It just so happens that, that dear Justin is a bully. I've seen him bully people. I saw him bully a woman chaplain of his at the Eucharist. It was very unpleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I had lunch with her afterwards and said, I'm so sorry, that must have been horrid for you. She said he does it all the time. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, Jane's transference is Jane's transference. And it's really, as it happens, these two things come together more by coincidence than, than any other rational connection, I think. I do need to apologize for some of the sound issues we've had. I have all the windows open here at the studio because it's finally 70 degrees out. And uh, it's nice that you're hearing cars go by. A lady with her baby who was crying walked by with the stroller. There's nothing I can do about that. That's just fun of Casual Monday. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton. This has been the very unscripted edition number 505 of Anglican Unscripted. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. Keep praying.